Let me introduce Mike Calicray, owner of Calicray Beef and Ranch Foods Direct. Uh, very early supporter of the market. Became good friends of mine once I found out what he was doing and once he found out what I was doing. Uh, he sells his meat here at the market and we're very happy to have him not only sell his, uh, his good meat products but also to talk about uh, his ranch operations which uh, I believe, based on what I've heard, sound like really high quality operations. I am really, really glad to be here today. I, you know, as we stand here in this building on South Santa Fe, uh, or south of downtown here in Denver uh, today, this is this is pretty cool. And and this is what you what you see here today are, are people who are really concerned about their food. They're concerned about where it comes from, how it's produced, and how it gets to your plate. And so we're right on the cutting edge of perhaps a, a major movement in our country. I know it's been coming for 20 years in a lot of places, but, but now we're getting it to, it seems, to the more more people, uh, that sort of critical mass, it seems like. And, and I know there's been some books out like, like Omnivore's Dilemma and Fast Food Nation and a film like Food Incorporated that woke people up a lot. Uh, we've had the Fresh film that told you after you saw Fast Food Nation and after you saw Food Incorporated, it, it brings on the, the excitement of the, of the solution, perhaps, which is what we're sitting here today and looking at is perhaps the solution to our food system. But I started out in about 1973 when I, when I bought my first cow herd. I bought 40 purebred Angus cows and I ran them on our ranch in St. Francis, Kansas. And, and I didn't know then what I was really getting into. I had grown up at Evergreen, Colorado, and gone to college and learned about agriculture, got very interested in agriculture because of a professor uh, by the name of Red Heath in Lamar, Colorado, who, who put me on his judging team and hauled me all over the country, and we judged animals and learned about agriculture all over, the, all over uh, this region, but also other parts of the United States. And so I went from there to Colorado State University where I got a degree in animal science. I would prefer to call it animal husbandry, but they changed it to animal science. And, and I got that degree and, and I went out ready to build the biggest feed yard that I could build and, and do all this industrial stuff that I learned at, at Colorado State University. And I did it. I, I went to Colorado, I went to uh, St. Francis, Kansas. I built a 14,000 head feed yard there by the name of Tri-State Feeders. I was one of the owners. I operated it for eight years. And then I got out. That was about 1986. And I built my own place. A 12,000 head cattle operation feed yard at St. Francis, Kansas. So I operated a, a, a while there. And about 1988, I realized this isn't working too well. You know, I'm, I'm investing all this capital, I'm doing all this work, I am applying all kinds of technology from implants to make cattle grow faster, hormones, steroids, antibiotics. We're doing everything we can to make money and nothing is enough. And, and, and what I realized in about 1988 is, is these big meat packers have got enough power today in fact, back then, four of them controlled over 80% of the market, and one of them, right here in Colorado, back then it was called ConAgra. It was Montfort, then ConAgra, then Swift, now it's JVS, which is a Brazilian owned company. And so I, I started to feel like a real fool. I had been educated at this land grant university in Colorado Springs, realizing that they were just preparing me to be part of a big industrial food system where I don't win, and where consumers most certainly do not win. But the big corporation in the middle, probably based on Wall Street, is extracting wealth and, and sort of laughing at us in a way as they show a 17 to 21 percent return on their investment while we continue to lose more equity every year. And so I really looked at it from a financial perspective of how I was going to stay in business. Well, I ended up in 1996 suing the biggest meat packer in the country, IBP, for anti-competitive practices because they were manipulating markets, fixing prices, cooperating with other packers, and, and causing farmers and ranchers to go out of business for lack of income. Well, when I did that, I really upset these guys. I upset all the big four packers. And so I wake up in late 1998, and I realize I've got 14,000 head of cattle on feed at my 12,000 head feed yard. So I was doing all the industrial things right. You know, I'm getting the throughput, right? It's full, and we, we're, you know, we're doing everything we can to, to try to make a dollar. 
And I suddenly realized I've been boycotted. My national beef buyer, the fourth biggest packer in the country, was kind enough to come into my office one day and he says, Mike, I can't buy your cattle anymore. He said, my boss told me not to buy from you because you're speaking poorly of the big meat packers. So I called up Dan Glickman, the Secretary of Agriculture, and I said, hey, Dan, he was from Kansas, a, a, a legislator, former congressman from Kansas, and I said, hey, what are you going to do about this? You know, there is a law, it's called the Packers and Stockyards Act, that says big meat packers can't manipulate prices. They can't do this stuff to reduce competition in the marketplace. I said, what are you going to do? He called Greeley, Colorado. We told ConAgra to buy my cattle. They bought them all over the next 90 days or so as they became ready and finished. They bought them all. And then I sat there with a big, beautiful, nice, well-designed, great cattle operation that's totally empty. And I've got a picture that's on my blog. If you go to blog.nobull.net and you scroll down a ways, there's this picture of my feeding operation with a caption under it that says emptiness. And this was part of the part of the uh, response that I gave to USDA in support of the GYPSA rules, which most of you probably haven't heard about, but the GYPSA rules are really important to us right now because we're going to try to make these big meat packers stop manipulating prices and compete and get a fair return back to the farm and ranch gate. And so when I decided that I was going to do do something different after after I, my feedlot was empty. I decided, you know, this isn't fair. I I, I'm, I can't be in this business because of the big market power of, of big meat packers. And and so I decided I'm going to start something new and different. Having the education that I have about animal production, knowing what I know about feeding cattle and and nutrition and and all of that, what could I do? What could I do to produce the absolute best beef possible? And I started putting those components together. Number one, the genetics. I want an Angus cow, and I want a Wagyu bull. What's the Wagyu bull to offer? Well, the Wagyu bull offers the best fat profile of any breed on the planet. More omega-3s, more CLA, a better, healthier fat profile genetically. What's the Angus cow offer? The Angus cow fits our area of St. Francis, Kansas, which is much like this. A little bit higher rainfall, but not a lot. We get about 17 inches of rainfall. But she's a moderately sized cow that fits the resource, the feed, the grass, resource, and her meat is of high quality. The calves that she will produce with the Wagyu especially will be very, very high quality meat. That's key if I'm going to go out and sell my product to the end consumer. It's got to be good. It's got to taste good. I can't just go out there and say, hey, everybody, the big meat packers have not been nice to me and I need you to buy my stuff because I can't sell to them. But you know what? It's the same thing they've got. You know, we, we, feed, we use all the hormones and the steroids and the antibiotics and, and the breeds of cattle that don't eat, really eat all that well because they produce a lot of red meat. But, you know, it's the same stuff you can get at King Supers and Safeway. That is not what I did. I decided I'm going to go out there and not only ask for your business, but I'm going to give you something far better than you can buy at any retail store, anywhere, or that you can even get at any restaurant unless they're using our product. And so that's what I did. Horm, uh, the, the Angus cow bred to a Wagyu bull produces a half-blood Wagyu Angus, a lot of marbling. Another cool thing about the Wagyu breed is they calve really easy. So we can breed these Angus heifers to these bulls and, and they don't have the calving problems. They stay in the herd, they stay healthy, and they breed back the next time. And, and you've got a cow now for 12 years that's going to produce good calves for you. Had I bred those heifers to a, a, another kind of breed that didn't calf so easy, I stood to lose a, a percentage, a fair percentage of those animals that would fall out of the herd. So that's another big benefit of the Wagyu breed. And so we started producing these cattle, these cattle with no hormones, no steroids, and no antibiotics, especially those antibiotics like Rumensin and Tylen and, and and you know, the non-therapeutic use, which we've now seen has caused a lot of problems in human medicine. The resistance of bacteria to these antibiotics is becoming very serious. You know, 75% of the antibiotics that China even uses today go into livestock production. Whose model have they copied? They've copied our model. 
And we know that most of the antibiotic use today in, in the United States is for livestock production. So we get rid of that stuff. But now I'm in a position, 